Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE. Covering Accelerate 2017. Brought to you by Fortinet. Now, here are your hosts, Lisa Martin and Peter Burris. Hey, welcome back to theCUBE. We are live in Las Vegas at Fortinet 2017. I'm your host, Fortinet Accelerate 2017, I should say. I'm your host, Lisa Martin, joined by my co-host, Peter Burris. We're really excited to be here today. First time for theCUBE, and we are next joined by Drew Jamada, who is the CFO of Fortinet. Drew, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, Lisa. Great to have you. I really enjoyed your keynote this morning. If you weren't able to see it, very passionate, very uh, intellectual keynote. Some of the, the nuggets here that I wanted to talk to you about first as we kick things off is just sharing with folks, you have over 20 years of financial management experience and network security. You said you started as a CPA. And as we look at kind of the, the, the generation of the business economy, the digital economy, and also now we're at this dawn of data. Love to get your perspective on defining that to our viewers. You mentioned that data is worthless if we can't trust it, and that really that it's key to business value. Can you kind of expound upon that? Um, how critical is data trust for an organization to achieve? Well, yeah, I think it's just core to value creation because um, you know it's as simple as if uh, you think that you're if you're putting information out there and you think somebody's going to get to it, then you may not put the information out there. But uh, I think I shared a statistic where a uh, consulting group said that there was 5x the value for data that you trust. You created more data if, if uh, you trusted it, and they got about 5x the data, the monetizable data, which grew, which ultimately is what drives value in the new economy. So if you look at the most valuable companies in the world, you know, uh, I think I was looking, at, I think I mentioned Amazon, Alphabet, Google, Facebook, Facebook yes. and Microsoft, all of them, cloud, mobility, you know, analytics, they're using data in their business models to drive it, right? But you trust them, right? And that's the key point. And they feverishly, energetically protect that data. And that's why you trust your data to put it there. But it's not just trust the data, yep. because one of the interesting things about data is because it can be copied, it can be shared. It's trust in future uses of that data. And so one of the big challenges sure. is not only do we have to be able to demonstrate that we have an infrastructure or fabric capabilities that allow us to trust data now, but also that it will allow us to change how we use the data, introduce new ways of using the data, and very quickly validate and verify that we can trust that use too. Is that Ab true? Absolutely, Peter, I think that's right. And I, I think most companies participating in a meaningful way in the new economy are very thoughtful about what data they're looking for and how they're going to monetize that data. You know, I think of the business models of, you know, clearly advertising engine, anything that's related to advertising, very clear to see that they need data to grow their business, right? And the core is the trust of that, and they continue to do that. Uh, but then you look at the other, the other data that, that's around. You're, many people aggregate data that they use and sell, sell back to you in some way for location-based services or personalized services, especially in healthcare, where you see that. And that's a very valuable story. And if you don't trust your healthcare data, you know, you're probably not going to trust whatever they're trying to sell you, right? But there's a lot of value for you personally simply because you can improve your health, maybe you live longer, maybe you avoid some illness that could be pretty painful. And so, but you have to ultimately trust that that's being used in a useful way for you and is protected so that it doesn't get into the wrong hands. So we think about digital business as a, as a boils down to very simply, digital, a digital business uses data to differentially create and sustain customers. Fair enough. So the idea then is that I now have to start looking at my data as an asset that can generate a return for shareholders, generate return for customers, generate return for other stakeholders. We don't typically think of data as an asset though. As, as you and your peers start thinking about how to start evaluating data or thinking about data as an asset, what, where, where are we on that journey? of getting to a point where we actually look at data as something that has, uh, that, that is a source of value in and of itself and creates value in new ways. Yeah, you know, uh, Peter, I think it might be helpful to actually even share some numbers because what comes to mind for me was uh, the McKinsey study that said the, there was about $7.8 trillion alone generated in 2015 that's monetizing data, right? So if that data weren't there, then that value wouldn't be there. And that's about 10% of the global economy. I mean, that's, that's amazing. 
And so, you know, just think about that, and you think about the companies that I mentioned earlier, you know, the value, they're about $2 trillion of market cap right there. Clearly the linchpin to that is, you know, digital trust, their use of data. And so you can grow it all the time. And so I, you know, I think of it as an asset. I think that I want to have it. I want to know how to protect it. I want an architecture that's proactive, that is driven by the business, right? But complemented by a secure infrastructure so that I know, people know that I have digital trust. I can trust the data, right? I have to print data as a CFO, right? If uh, my investors don't trust it, guess what? I have a problem, right? And so I think it's the same way around in anything you do business-wise. And just think as data being the fuel of the next generation economy. Uh, you know, look, data is also power, uh, not to get into politics, but you know, think of the power of the data that the, uh, the Trump campaign had you know, in the upper Midwest, they had some data that obviously the other side didn't have, and it was very useful for them in crafting their message and getting elected. Yeah, I think we can definitely agree, no matter what side of that fence you're on, that there was influence there um, from an election perspective. One of the things though, that I'm interested in getting your perspective on is you, sure. you were talking about, um, the in your keynote this morning, the role of the C-suite, how it's changing. You said it's kind of cliche, but in the last five to seven years, we've seen this uh, either emergence of the CISO or maybe an evolution from the CSO to the CISO. And uh, there was a panel this morning of three CISOs from AT&T, Lazard, and uh, Levi's. And my first, uh, kind of my ear went up wondering if I was going to hear cybersecurity differences based on the industry. Um, and it really seemed, and what we've heard from some of your peers and technology partners on the show today is it's quite agnostic. But I'd love to get your take on your, you were talking about how you view as a CFO data as an asset. In the role of the CISO, is this guy or gal, when it comes to cybersecurity, are they now on the front lines as the leader of a corporation's digital army, or is that role, or is that digital army now maybe a little bit more broad across that C-suite in, in a company that needs to trust data in order to have value? Great question, Lisa, and it was a great panel. The, what I took away from it was that the CISO is very much the quarterback, right? So I think everybody plays a role, it's a team. And when they break huddle, everybody has an assignment, but they, they, they look at the play they're going to call and, and they run it. And the, uh, the, the CISO is really taking information from everybody and rolling it together in a way to underlie the trust, you're making sure that they're driving towards digital trust ultimately. And that's the role. And, they have to take input from the CEO, you know, on the business, on the uh, business proposition, the vision, the CFO on risk, and you know, the investment profile, the CIO on uh, how they're going to drive the business with IT, and then their role is ultimately to advise and help drive the business going forward, you know, and make sure they're compliant. I, when, when you talk about verticals, I think it's generally agnostic. I think there are some areas where there's a little bit of there's obviously some compliance with credit cards and financial institutions and healthcare clearly, you know, given, given the, uh, the, uh, the information there. But uh, generally speaking, I think it's the same all around. If they're successful, uh, you know, the key is to not be right themselves, but to get it right with that team. Right, I love the analogy of the quarterback, actually. Um, we were talking actually before we started this segment that um, there's estimates that a CISO is inheriting more than 25 different security technologies to defend and protect and remediate. And we've been talking as well with some other guests today on the show that a lot of companies now have this sort of assumed uh, breach mentality. Can you expand a little bit more on that, that CISO as the quarterback, what they're inheriting and how they navigate, need to navigate through that environment in order to extract value um, from that data? Yeah, well, it's, it's the vectors that we all hear every day, right? It's IoT, you hear more mobility, uh, more cloud, you know, more data, just, and, and even some of the things out there just generate data, right? And so I think it's just an aggregation of an architecture uh, that reflects that. There's a lot of siloed business units ruling their own technology, right? And there's a lack of talent. I think that came up a lot this morning was just the complete lack of talent. There's a lot of people in college, but they don't have a lot of experience yet. So I think we still have a dearth of talent. Uh, there's some compliance, and then ultimately you're trying to get the best architecture for the company. And so I think that's the quarterback, really trying to bring all those conversations to the table, uh, help the company draft a vision that's business forward, that underlies, uh, that reflects digital trust ultimately, and uh, reflects something that's uh, affordable and manageable. And I think you do that with an architecture, 
a lot of listening. I think the key is listening. Again, what I said earlier, it's not about any one person being right. It's about getting it right for the company and their customers so that they trust the data. It's a great message. Fantastic. As you think about the uh, evolution of the relationship between the CFO, sure. who has a responsibility for risk and generating return on assets, and the CISO, who is part of this new team that's going to increasingly have to think in terms of creating digital asset value, how is that relationship going to change over the next few years? Well, I think the new awakening, the message is that uh, there's an opportunity for value creation. One of the things I said this morning, as a CFO, I, I love it when somebody brings me an investment, an alternative, right? If they just bring me a cost, you know, I, <laughs> That's I a take cost. a deep breath. <laughs> and you say no. I deep, yeah, I take a deep breath, <laughs> and I try not to say no, but sometimes you, you can't control it. But, but really, you always want to think about the business first. I mean, that's the job, right? Uh, CFO, certainly, you know, you're thinking about your shareholders. You're trying to find them an appropriate return, the best possible return on the investment. And so it, it's always investment forward. Think about the investment. Does it provide the right type of return? And I don't see how anybody can argue that in this dawn of data, if you will, the dawn of it, the, all the analytical opportunities out there and the ability to drive a business with that data and the value it creates, the trust is at the core and investing in that trust is a great idea. But part, also it means, I would think, that you, that there's, there's going to be some experience curves associated with this process. Correct. And your ability to go up the experience curves in your business is highly dependent upon how successful you are at choosing partners and laying trust and putting trust in those partners so that they can do a great job of what they're doing as well. So how does Fortinet tell its story to its customers that Working with us, you will have a trusted partner, but also we will be providing the platform that will facilitate you being a more trusted partner. Well, Peter, that's a, from my perspective, that's an easy question. Uh, it's Fortinet's security fabric, and everybody's talking about platform, but platform is like a ship with containers on it, right? You may bolt them down, but the, you know, if the ship tilts, they fall off. A fabric is knitted together, right? It's, it's not a patchwork, it's not threads, it's a coat, right? It's, it's something that, you bought to protect you. And Fortinet Security Fabric takes, reflects the breadth of product portfolio we have. It goes through the cloud, into IoT, provides uh, the performance necessary to run the business. It doesn't create friction. It's broad, it's powerful, uh, and it's secure. And you get that transparency across the business. You don't have to, it, it updates itself automatically. It's fully integrated, um, and it works for today and tomorrow. So one last question sure. here, uh, Drew, giving you the last word. One of the things that I also uh, found really intriguing this morning was that you were talking about the difference between selling fear versus selling value. Right. As we look at where Fortinet is today, um, and also Kenzie, the CEO, did mention this morning that you've got this goal as a company to become number one by 2020, which is just a few years away. What excites you about the announcements today as well as the vision of Fortinet going forward to really enable your customers and your partners to deliver the trust that those customers need. Yeah, I think we're helping them be business forward. I think we're helping them be business first. I, when I look out there and I see everybody saying, oh, the attack surface is increasing, you know, cyber crime, cyber criminals, somebody hacking away in a garage and uh, some country far away and they can easily do this. I mean, those things are generally true, but what I really want to do is build an infrastructure that drives my business so that I can participate in a big way in where the economy is going. And that's about data and analytics. It's like I said, it's the dawn of data. And I think we can do that in a very differentiated way and a very value-oriented way for, for our customers that no one else can do. And that's Fortinet Security Fabric. Well, what a fantastic way to end the conversation there. I love that you said how important the role of listening is. I think that's uh, quite an agnostic importance there. Drew Delmato, CFO of Fortinet, thanks so much for joining us on theCUBE. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Drew. And on behalf of Peter Burris, I'm Lisa Martin. You've been watching theCUBE. Stay tuned, we'll be right back.